OCATs coming up. That's the purpose of this lecture. I think those of you that I've worked with closely are kind of uh, aware of my philosophy of why we do OCAPs. It isn't just to terrorize you. It, we already think you're pretty smart folks or you wouldn't be in the program. Um, I think its main purpose is to cause you to collect all the information you've kind of gone through in the course of the last year and for some of you the last two or three years and put it together and assimilate it and think about it. And I think for that purpose, it is a useful exercise. Now in terms of stuff to go through, knowing where blood or the, the muscles start, thinking about pediatric ophthalmology things, and the origins, insertions, you may get questions about, you know, which muscles, you know, like which muscle does not originate, which muscles from the annulus is in, and there are two, inferior oblique, superior oblique, uh, which, you know, do the blood, the nerves, blood vessels come from inside the cone, outside the cone, the uh, insertion, how far the insertions are from the limbus, those are all issues. There's usually a question about which muscle has the shortest insertion or the shortest tendon, well, that'd be inferior oblique. Um, the longest, obviously, is superior oblique. And so that I, I think that just knowing, you know, having an idea what these numbers are, realizing that those of you who have spent time actually doing eye muscle surgery uh, with us uh, realize that uh, those numbers aren't exact. They vary. Those are averages over large numbers of people. And I think that this idea, though, of the location, and, and Griffin touched on this in Grand Rounds the other day, Dr. Jardine, about this issue of the relationship of visual axis, the angle that the vertical rectus muscles make and the oblique muscles make, because the oblique muscles, remember, underneath this, this is looking from superior, the inferior oblique comes from the floor of the orbit nasally and wraps under the eye. Look at the parallel nature of the superior oblique, inferior oblique, and the superior rectus, inferior rectus, that is what resp is, is responsible for this issue of separating the vertical function, superior rectus, inferior rectus, and abduction, inferior oblique elevator, superior oblique depressor, and adduction. And knowing those relationships and having an idea of how all that works is important. Um, and there's a lot of information on here the thing that I would recommend that you remember, there may be a question about primary, secondary, tertiary functions of muscles. You may find something about this angle of orientation to the visual axis, which is the direction of, of pull. And, and this has to do with what we were just talking about with lining the eye up with the direction of action of the muscle. And when you're directly opposed to that, the vertical muscles, in contrast, have their major cyclorotatory function. Now, these axes of FIC, this kind of shows up once in a while. The question might be, which axis of FIC do the horizontal rectus muscles rotate the muscle around? Well, that would be the z-axis. And if you're talking about the vertical rectus muscles, it would be the x-axis and the torsional aspects are on the y-axis. You know, like pitch roll and yaw, on an airplane, I don't use those terms commonly. You won't hear me use them, but they do show up. We're gonna run through this quickly. If there's something that isn't clear that you have a question about, stop me, because the reason we're doing this is to try to go through this somewhat rapid fire to spur your thinking about things you might wanna review before you take that darn test. Um, now, monocular eye movements, ductions. We talk about superduction, infraduction, adduction, abduction, and then X cyclo. If you take a mark, make a mark at 12 o'clock on my left eye, rotate it out this way, X cyclo, in is in cyclo. And thinking about that in terms of your eyes and which way things go is another thing we'll talk about when we talk review this three-step test uh, that was touched on at Grand Rounds the other day. Binocular eye movements that involve both eyes going in the same direction, and that would be basic or, or, or versions. And versions, we talk about dextro and levoversion, right and left gaze, superversion, infraversion, and you can also talk about the eyes rotating if I tip my head to the left to this dextro cycloversion, although people don't usually use that. We usually think about torsion in terms of you know, monocular, excyclo, or incyclo movements, but that is used by some people. 
And then there are vergence movements, the dissimilar movements, which most typically are either convergence or divergence. I'll realize we have vergence movements that are both vertical and torsional as well to maintain fusion. Now, what about Herring's law? Herring's law is, a, uh, you know, get, we get into physiology and doing muscle recordings, what happens is that the muscles that are called yoke muscles, the muscles that move the eye in the same direction, like my left lateral, right medial rectus when I'm looking to the left, if you measure it, you get the same amount of neural input to each muscle. That is where primary and secondary deviations that we'll touch on come from. If you are fixing with a normal eye, you have a paretic lateral rectus, the smaller amount of esotropia, because it doesn't take a lot of neural input to maintain the normal eye fixing, is, is a smaller esotropia because you're not having to use as much input. There isn't as much input going to the fellow eye. Whereas when you fix with the paretic eye, it requires a lot of effort from a lateral rectus that's not working very well. That also goes to the contralateral medial rectus. You wind up with a larger <coughs> secondary deviation. So that's something, again, it might be a question about which is the primary deviation, which is the secondary deviation. Herring's law. Now, Sherrington's law. All that says is that when I take my right eye, I move it to the right, there's increased firing in my lateral rectus, decreased firing in my medial rectus. So that has to, and, and that comes into play when we think about things like Duane syndrome. In Duane syndrome, we talk about co-contraction. If I have Duane's type one in my left eye, the reason the lids look like they're closed, you get fissure narrowing on abduction, is you wind up with firing of both muscles. So it's an aberration of what happens in Sherrington's law. Now, diagnostic positions of gaze, and they occasionally will say, well, which of these are diagnostic positions of gaze? Diagnostic positions of gaze are where you can have a high likelihood of separating and having a single muscle be the mover of the eye. Right and left gaze, it's pretty easy. My right lateral rectus abducts my right eye. The medial rectus in my left eye abducts the left eye. When I go straight up and down, it turns out it's a mix of superior rectus, inferior oblique, and inferior oblique, or rather superior oblique and inferior rectus going down. And so straight up and straight down are not diagnostic. When you get in the oblique functions, that's where we separate the elevators and the depressors in each side. That's where that term comes from. And uh, thanks for joining us. <laughs> it's interesting outside, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure my little car was going to make it. I think my car tried to pole vault out the end of my driveway from the trailer hitch this morning as I slid down into the road. I'm uh, feeling lucky to be here. Now, this physiology, some of this stuff is useful. Some of it is useful only for OCAPs. All of it will kind of increase your understanding of how things work. And I think it's pretty cool stuff to think about at times. But we're going to look here at the, the idea of retinal correspondence, the horopter veith muller circle that does sometimes show up, issues of stereopsis, sensory, motor fusion, and I'm not going to talk about M&P systems. That, uh, I don't find that really exciting. But anyway, the idea, as far as retinal correspondence, the idea is that when these eyes are looking at point F, Every point on this circle, that's the Wieth Mueller circle, theoretically projects to an, a, a, a place in the retina in each eye that corresponds to each other. So that the representation of occipital cortex is of the same thing. And when things are lined up, and, and, and retinal correspondence is something that develops early in infancy. If your eyes are straight and work together in infancy, you will likely have normal retinal correspondence. If you develop strabismus and later in life, you have a motorbike accident in Surabaya, Indonesia. Turns out they're very common. I was just there. Um, and you wind up with a sixth nerve palsy um, and you have normal retinal correspondence, you're going to see double because the things that are corresponding to each other are no longer lined up. Contrast that to the kid who's got infantile esotropia, whose eyes were never misaligned early in infancy they never have normal retinal correspondence. The most that we can hope for in them is usually some aberration of anomalous correspondence where because the eyes are misaligned, 
I have my fovea in the left eye looking at things, my right eye is turned in. Part of my nasal retina thinks it's the fovea for the right eye. And so um, then you wind up with what is called a suppression scotoma, enough information ignored to avoid diplopia. That's what suppression is all about. It serves a useful purpose. If we could not straighten eyes, you had misaligned eyes early in childhood, you have a choice between I'm going to go through life seeing double all the time. That turns out not to be something that allows one to gather food, hunt animals, things of that sort, which was with our ancestors. Those were important things. And so it's selected for people who could ignore that. And that's likely how that all developed. Now, what else can we learn from this? There will be a question often about looking at point F. If you're looking at a point here or here, what, what, you know, what is the patient's sense of things? And the idea, there is this range, and it's narrow. If you take a second point either in front or behind this point that we're looking at, where as you're looking at that point, you'll have a sense of depth because there's a little bit of disparity in the two eyes. Once you get outside that range in this area, you don't just see it as depth. You see two different things. You have double vision. If you want to play with this yourself, take a couple of pieces of wire coat hanger, look at the coat hanger, and take things and move it back and forth, and you can see where you see it, and it looks like it's here, and suddenly you're seeing two things. The second thing that'll happen is you'll notice that as you get farther away, you can go farther before you get that sense of I'm seeing double. And that's because this is required, there's the tolerances are much greater here than they are in, in the peripheral parts of the retina. These areas here are going to be close to fixation. Now, normal retinal correspondence we touched on. There are sort of two variants of things didn't develop quite normally. One is what is called harmonious, the other is called non-harmonious. What that really refers to is changes in adaptation as the visual system develops. Let's say I was 50 ET for the first two years of life, then somebody did a little bit of surgery and I became 30 ET. So at the moment, my visual system is still thinking I'm 50 ET, but actually it looks like I'm 30 ET. That refers, that's really what's going on with, with non-harmonious retinal correspondence. If I am 30 diopters ET, and my visual system thinks it's 30 ET, that's harmonious. And if there is some disparity due to whatever has happened, the term generally used for that is non-harmonious. And these are all, without exception, functions of I had early childhood strabismus. If you see this in a patient on the neuro-ophthalmology service, you can see you're, 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 they're, they've suddenly realized at two in the morning that <laughs> Things aren't okay with their eyes, and they show up and they want an MRI scan, and somebody wants to do an LP, and you're convinced they've got anomalous retinal correspondence. You can pretty certainly say this has been going on for years, and it's among the suddenly noticed. And I know that some of you have been in that situation. I've seen amblyopic adults that I've been asked to see down the road who suddenly on Saturday night reached up to get something and realized they didn't see out of this eye for the first time in their life and had the major neural workup just to say, look, you have decreased vision, you have no stereopsis, your eyes are misaligned, this has been this way all of your life. You know, it's a shame you didn't know it till now, and, and that is kind of amazing and probably says something about your innate thinking ability uh, or observational skills, but there you are. Now, suppression. Suppression is a binocular function. If I'm suppressing from my left eye to avoid diplopia, when I cover my right eye and I do a visual field, everything's going to be fine. It, it is only there under binocular viewing conditions. Monofixation refers to a situation where most of everything works together, probably not in an exactly normal way, but works together, um, and things correspond in one eye to the other, and there's very tiny suppression scotoma. This turns out to be a very stable arrangement in terms of alignment. This is what we wind up achieving in most kids with infantile esotropia, some kids with infantile exotropia, although it's harder to do. The advantage is they don't see double. They usually have pretty close to normal vision. 
and their eyes don't wander greatly. They don't require additional surgeries. And then diplopia, and there are two things here that we, this, this idea of crossed and uncrossed diplopia that we need to understand to be able to make sense of what happens with those pictures that they show you uh, uh, with the Bagolini lenses and the monofixation things, which still often show up on OCAP caps, although they are of virtually no practical use to anybody and no one uses them except the torture residents and fellows in some institutions well, like Johns Hopkins and places mm -hmm. like that where I still think they drag, Dave Guyton drags his stuff out, but it isn't because it's useful to anybody. It's just because he can. Mm -hmm. And the idea with esotropia, when the eyes are crossed, the image, if my right eye is turned in, is going to project on the nasal retina. Does that make sense to everybody? And now normally, if you take, and when we talk about nasal retina, we're talking about everything that is nasal to the fovea, temporal retina, everything that's temporal to the fovea in my right eye. And normally, my nasal retina has to do with temporal visual space, correct? So if something is my retinas correspond normally to each other. We turn my right eye in. If I have something in my nasal retina seeing the same thing that my left eye is looking at with its fovea, that nasal retina is going to tell me that that object is off in temporal space. Does that make sense? So that's where the idea of esotropia and uncrossed diplopia. The image from my right eye is going to be off to the right. Contrast that to exotropia. When my right eye turns out, the object of regard is going to fall on the temporal retina. Everything from the fovea temporally, and it's not from optic nerve, it's from the fovea. Everything out there in temporal retina is going to tell me that it's on the nasal side, which is why you get crossed diplopia. So cross diplopia, remember the cross and exotropia, cross diplopia. If you can't, just think through it. but. Some of these, knowing how to think through it, is, is what I'm trying to, where I'm trying to go with this, because I think that's a better way to approach life. <clears throat> now, levels of binocularity. It goes from the, I'm capable of seeing things with the two eyes at the same time, to I'm kind of able to put them together, to higher order, I can really put them together, and then lastly, I can perceive stereopsis, which basically just means that I've got a little bit different perspective of the world from the two eyes. And yes, it turns out that if you have hypertelorism, your stereopsis, theoretically at least, is better. And I used to give James Zimmerman's dad a hard time about this because nobody had more widely spaced eyes. I've never met a human with more widely spaced <laughs> eyes. And so I, 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 I told Paul that I thought he must have just superhuman stereopsis, and he kind of operated like he did. So it was a good thing he was very good under the microscope. And then, uh, so again, simultaneous perception, sensory fusion, and stereopsis are kind of the three levels they talk about in the home study course book. These things, these images share nothing in common. If you can put them together, that's simultaneous perception. If the patient tells you, you project slides independently to each eye in an amblyoscope. Now this, there are different things, and if this patient can superimpose the boats and come up with the different figures, that means that we're, you know, a little higher level than I'm just seeing it with the two eyes. I can put those images on top of each other, horizontally, vertically, torsionally, and see them at the same time. And then if I perceive stereopsis, it looks like the red arrow is sticking out because of that little bit of disparity that is here. That, again, is a higher level. I'm not going to belabor that. I'm not going to rest on that stuff. But now you'll, they'll talk at times about tests of binocularity. Claude Worth was a famous pediatric ophthalmologist, or ophthalmologist. They didn't have pediatric ophthalmologists then. This test is named after him. And, and his, um, you know, this test, basically, where you take red lens before the right eye, R&R, &R, green lens before the left eye, and then have this series of green, red, and white dots that you look at allows you to assess whether the patient is binocular. It is not a test of stereopsis. And people usually use that to convince the patient that they're using the two eyes together to some extent and make themselves feel better after they've done surgery. 
um, not that it really provides useful functional information for the patient. The Bagolini lenses, Bruno Bagolini was an Italian ophthalmologist who has these striated glasses that are mounted in a glasses frame at angles. It's the same thing as doing Maddox, double Maddox rods, um, but you can see through it. So the patient isn't totally dissociated. And his idea with this, and this all has to do with just crossed, uncrossed diplopia, suppression, and things of that sort to figure those pictures out. We're gonna look at those. After image testing, with the Bagolini lenses, we're looking at a light source. That's what the little dot is in all those pictures. And you're doing it with both eyes open. After image testing, different scenario. What you're doing there is you're asking the patient to look at a little target that isn't brightly lit while there's a light bulb that sticks out either way, either vertically or horizontally. You present it vertically to one eye, you present it horizontally to the other eye. If you have reasonably good vision and the patient has a fovea, the fovea will be looking at the target. So what you want to think of the after image test is doing is tagging each eye. You're tagging the fovea and then you're asking the patient, where do you think your fovea is based on what's going on with your eyes? Whereas again, bagging the lenses, you've got both eyes open and it's done under binocular circumstances where with after image testing, I, I would stare at the thing for 30 seconds with my right eye, then I would stare at it this way with my left eye for 30 seconds, and then they say, what do you see? And that's why it's the after image and, and that horrible thing that you get you know, after somebody flashes a flash bulb or a camera flash right in your face, that's what you see. And, and uh, have I ever done that to a patient in the office? No, my attention span is not long enough to do that test. Now, Worth 4 dot, we've talked about a bit, and this is Hilda Capo, who is a pediatric ophthalmologist in Miami when she was just a bit younger, and uh, showing the red-green glasses. And these are the targets, so this is what they're looking at, and you've got two green, one red, and this light can either be seen as green, red or pink or kind of off green. Different people do different things. But if they see some combination of four dots, chances are they're binocular and they're normal. Um, if on the other hand, they see just green dots, it means they're suppressing the right eye. If they see just red dots, they're suppressing the left eye. If they see more than four dots, and, it, you, know, and you see some combination of the three and the two, like five dots, you're diplopic. And if they see six or more, either they need a refraction or they're crazy. <laughs> now the Bagolini lenses talked about, and these are the pictures, and this again comes back to this issue simply, and these are the pictures they show you, and they'll show you a patient with esotropia or exotropia. And the question here comes down to whether, this is, this is only really useful in the patient who's got normal retinal correspondence, and then you've made the eyes misaligned you're saying what happens, and this comes back to this crossed and uncrossed diplopia. So that in, this is the, the dot of light, and this is what you need to think about, where the dot is. And with esotropia, we said they have uncrossed diplopia. The image from the right is gonna go to the right, it has. It's moved over to the right. That's where this picture comes from. Whereas with diplopia, or I mean with exotropia, you've got crossed diplopia, the image from the right eye is going to move over to the left side, which it has here. I, when I was a resident, tried to figure this out in some terms related to whether the, these lines crossed above or below, and, and it makes absolutely no sense. Don't do that. It, 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 I never could make sense of it until it just dawned on me that what they're doing, these are just, if you're looking at the transilluminator light tip, whether the light looks like it's gone this way or that way, and the rest of it follows, this, the other issues here, if you've got a very small suppression scotoma, the, the eye that has that, you'll see a small gap in the line. Most patients can't appreciate it. And if they've got a huge, you know, like dense amblyopia, um, chances are they're not gonna see the line at all. So that I don't really find this to be a useful thing in the clinic. What you will see in my clinic is using the Bagolini lenses to do a real world measurement of torsion. I think they're elegant for that, where you make the lines horizontal and then have the patient adjust things so things look level. And, and that, again, because it doesn't dissociate, I find more useful in planning surgery than using 
the double Maddox rods, but you need to realize that that is not a universal concept and there's not general agreement about that even in our division. Um, after image testing, and again with this, the issue comes down with these pictures when you look at this, and this is the opposite with the patient who is ET, uh, where we're stimulating nasal retina, thinking it's the fovea, you wind up with cross diplopia uh, for the same reason you had cross non cross diplopia in the patient's esotropic, because what you're doing is you're asking where you're, you're labeling the real fovea, assuming they've got good vision, and then you're asking where does the eye think that fovea is? And the idea with this patient who's got, if you've got normal retinal correspondence, the other question they'll show with this is they'll take a patient who's got 100 diopters of ET and 50 diopters of hyper and 20 diopters of in cyclo rotation, and they'll say the patient has normal retinal correspondence. What does the after image test look like? And what the after image test is going to look like is it's going to look like this because the fovea is corresponding to the fovea in the other eye. The patient is diplopic when the eyes are open. Realize we're labeling each eye on its own and then asking the patient where you think it is. And so that's a trick question and that does show up. If they've got normal retinal correspondence, this is what you're going to see and it doesn't matter whether they're misaligned or not. And now, if you've got esotropia, in this patient who is esotropic, what happens is that I'm labeling the fovea, but now because my eye is turned in and there's something in the nasal retina that thinks it's the fovea when I'm binocular, the idea is that the fovea is behaving as if it is part of my temporal retina, okay? And we stimulate temporal retina most commonly when we're exotropic. It's the way I sort these things out. And so when we're exotropic, we have crossed diplopia, and hence we see the image from the right eye over here on the left side, or crossed diplopia, and it's just the opposite. Sit down and think through that. That is the way to make sense of this. It's what's going on. It's a matter of when I stimulate labeled fovea, looking at just one eye, and then I let the patient be binocular. If my eyes work together normally, this is what's going to happen, even if they're misaligned. But if we've got anomalous retinal correspondence, when you're monocular, you're still going to label a fovea. But then with your brain sorting it out because of the anomalous retinal correspondence, it's going to look as if it is part of wherever it thinks the fovea is. And it's, it's weird, and, and again, does this help us in clinic? No, it really doesn't. Um, now, titmus test, Randot test. With a titmus, watch for monocular clues. Randot test, because there aren't monocular clues most of the time, is probably more accurate, but there's some people's brains who just will not do it. They turn out to have pretty good stereopsis. Um, and this is the titmus test. The idea, to go back to this, with the this monocular clues, the idea is if you look at that book with one eye, without the glasses on, I can get six of those things right just asking the question which is different, not does it stick up. If you want to find out if they're doing that, what you do is with the glasses on, turn the book upside down. The things that stuck up should look like they go in, and if they don't, there's something not right and, and suspect it. Where I pick this up is when I have my staff tell me a patient has eight out of nine circles or seven out of nine circles and a patient who's got 50 diopters of constant esotropia and I know the patient doesn't have good stereopsis and then you say, how did this result happen? And the idea, and I'll just grab the book, put the glasses on them and say, does that stick up? And they say, no. Does it stick down? No. Um, but I can tell you that one's different. And, and it's a useful thing to think about. Now, let's ramble through this. The amblyoscope, you don't need to know about. It makes a great boat anchor. Uh, we have one around somewhere in a storage room. I think Kathleen Degree had it for a while and played with it in Neuro Clinic, but I, I, I don't use it. Now, amblyopia, just to kind of, you know, there'll be questions about this. It is important to know about as well. This is the incidence. These are the different, you know, entities and the way I kind of, uh, think about as far as strabismic and isometropic, amotropic, meaning both eyes out of focus, 
deprivation, there's something preventing vision, like a scar lid down with a hemangioma. And um, basically, we eliminate the causes, create equal clear images, do occlusion or penalization, um, occlusion patching. And one of the things they may ask you about, you can do up to about a week of full-time occlusion per year of age without having to recheck a child or you're going to cause occlusion amblyopia. That does show up so that if they were to say, well, you're going to see this uh, two-month-old, you're going to patch them full-time, which nobody does anymore, but it'll still show up on here, and see them back in six months, um, that would be a bad thing to do. I would not recommend it. Now, strabismus, different types of deviations, I think we're all on board with that. Angle kappa is one of the things that often shows up with a question about angle kappa. The way to remember this is that in retinopathy prematurity, we see positive angle kappa. The question is, does it look like they're XT, does it look like they're ET, and which one is which? In ROP, where usually the fovea is dragged temporally, causing the eye to look like it's turned out even though it's lined up, that's positive angle kappa. And if you remember that, you can figure out the angle cap question. And I mean, it is fascinating. I have a passel of kids I follow who when you do cover testing, they are clearly esotropic, all post preemies with bad ROP, but when you look at them, they look like they're 40 diopters XT. And so then you have a conversation with the parents and you say, I could make your child look really funny and her eyes would work together better because um, then what you're going to do to fix the esotropy is make her look more XT and very few patients will take you up on that. And I don't think I would either as a parent. That'd be a bad, oh, let's back up here for a second. And so the other, we're going to touch on this three-step test in just a bit and uh, keep rambling here. Now, as far as esotropia, infantile, accommodative ET, paretic, and then there are the really cool things like Duane syndrome, spasm near divergence paralysis, deprivation, dissociated horizontal deviation. Remember there are three parts of the dissociated strabismus complex. Vertical, X cyclo rotation, and an outturning, all of which are a function of early abnormal binocularity. That's the only place you develop any of that dissociated strabismus. So when you see DVD, that means you had misaligned eyes early in life. Exotropia, intermittent, far and away the most common thing. And there is a huge disparity in terms of geographic and racial distribution of strabismus in Asia. Nine out of 10 patients I see with strabismus are exo. It is rare to see esotropia in Surabaya, Indonesia, or in Kathmandu, Nepal. On the other hand, here, accommodative esotropia is the norm. We see accommodative estropes coming out of our ears. When I was in Indiana, we saw infantile esotropia many more times than we saw accommodative ET. Why that is, I'm not sure, but it probably says something about Hoosiers. Um, <laughs> sensory deviations that I put up there, basically a sensory deviation means that there is something wrong with vision in the eye and the crossing developed secondary to not seeing well. Turns out that early in infancy, most eyes will turn in Whereas if I developed optic neuritis and lost vision in my right eye, over time my right eye would probably turn out. And it has to do with relative accommodative and convergent tone at different points in life. <coughs> now, <coughs> what was on that slide? <coughs> okay, vertical deviations. We touched on DVD. Thyroid disease is the answer. Most common acquired vertical diplopia in adults actually most common acquired diplopia in adults, it would still be thyroid disease. Oblique dysfunction, superior oblique palsy being far and away the most common in separating this issue of congenital and acquired is, is really important because of the various CNS lesions that can go along with that. And then we'll touch on A and B patterns a bit, although we just talked about that the other day in Grand Round, so I'm not gonna belabor it. Now show and tell, and we'll flip through these. So what's going on here? Esotropia, right? Right esotropia, exotropia. What's going on here? So, how many different things do you see wrong with that patient? 
Yeah, at least three. The eyes turned out, it's down, there's a little bit of ptosis, and there's some anisocoria. So this kid's got a third nerve palsy and a brain tumor. Okay, and that's the reason we worry about these things and whether things are congenital, whether they're acquired, and in terms of pattern recognition and picking out cranial nerve palsies. Every time you see a patient with strabismus, although we kind of get complacent, we see them in Pete's clinic, and most kids we see have accommodative estropia. When I get a call from a pediatrician saying, little Susie's eyes are suddenly crossed, usually it's just that they've got accommodative ET and parents noticed it. But the reason we have them come up and we see them today is because we do see kids who they've got a posterior fossa tumor that got increased intracranial pressure and bilateral sixth nerve palsy, swollen nerves, and they need to see the neurosurgeons and the oncologists right away. And separating those, the only way I found to do that is to take a look at them and do it urgently. Now, this is an intermittent deviation where when we've taken this patient who has straight eyes, we've covered this eye, this eye is remaining crossed. So this isn't just a phoria. A phoria, as soon as you take the cover away, things are gonna go back to normal, they're gonna maintain fusion. This is an intermittent deviation. This patient is uh, very interesting, and this is the same child, photos taken years apart, and when you look, it sure looks like that left eye could be esotropic. As it turns out, the eyes are perfectly straight here, they are still perfectly straight here, and that is pseudoesotropia with resolution of the appearance because you no longer get the sense in that bottom photo that the eyes are crossed. Angle kappa, we touched on. This red lens test is done by people at Walmart everywhere, um, and not by many other folks. I, I'm not a fan. Um, I think that as uh, ophthalmologists, we should be able to sort things out a little more accurately. This is, I'm trolling for some misalignment and you should be able to look at the patient, do cover testing, and do it in more elegant fashion or I'll be disappointed in you. Um, so the idea is you have them looking at a white light source with the Maddox rod, they're gonna see a line through it. If the light source and the Maddox rod line up, there's a good chance that their eyes are lined up. That's what you're trying to answer. And um, this uh, Hess red-green goggles, the idea is, the question is, where does the patient think things are compared to what the examiner is showing them? Uh, I do have a set of these goggles. Judith Warner has them somewhere. I haven't seen them in about 15 years. Um, and I'm not sure that she still has them. Um, but they are. Rampage, I'll show a while, trying to find them. Yes, and, 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 and that's usually when I've asked her if anyone has seen my Lancaster red green uh, you know, uh, wands because she knows she has them. Um, obviously, I don't use them very much, and we talked about this. This is the after image tester. So you look at this thing, and then this light shows through this, and I have one somewhere in my office. I think Nero had that for a while. That I did get them to give back um, and bring it out once in a while for show and tell, but the bulb doesn't work anymore, so it's not nearly as exciting. <laughs> this is a vascular lesion. Amblyopia would be the big culprit, and if you wanted to treat this kid systemically with something, what would be the treatment of choice? Propranolol, right? Now, and you'd worry about what you want to make sure the patient doesn't have so you don't kill them. Faces, that's right. And that may show up on here as well, P-H-A-C-E-S for those that aren't familiar with that. Um, and that's why we admit children to the hospital to start you know, beta blocker treatment. It turns out that it was observed in kids who were on beta blockers who had vascular lesions that the vascular lesions regressed. That's where that came from. It was a fortuitous observation. Um, the same way that a, a child who was getting steroids, people noticed, you know, that's where the idea of injecting steroids interlesionally um, or using systemic steroids was a fortuitous observation as well. Um, in any event, causing the, the lesion to regress so that it isn't blocking vision, pushing on the eye, causing anisometropia, or causing misalignment of the eyes, all of which can cause amblyopia. In this patient, what have we got here? Patient has crossed eyes. This is esotropia, right? Right esotropia, left eye's looking at you. The eyes look straighter with these hyperopic spectacles. Diagnosis? Accommodative VT. Now this patient who is straight at distance, but through the top of the glasses has massive esotropia. Through these bifocals looks much straighter. What have we got? Well, you've got accommodative esotropia with a high ACA ratio, meaning accommodative convergence to accommodation. What that means is that per unit of focusing, I get more crossing. And so 
And those are folks, the only way you can sort that out is with them in their full cyclopedic refraction, knowing their straight at distance and they're crossing it near. You know, the idea of looking at them in the office saying, well, it looks to me like they're 30 ET at distance and they're 40 ET at near, I'm gonna put them in bifocals. Don't go there. Put them in their full cycloplegic refraction. But this idea of a high ACA ratio, the appropriate treatment for that is to put them in the bifocals and then try to wean them over a number of years. Now this patient, basically what we're seeing here is just alternating fixation in a child who's got infantile esotropia. This child, this is this eye, this eye is crossed all the time. Somebody told them it would go away as a child grew and it didn't, they came to see you. What is this? What part of the eye is that? That's the optic nerve. Is it normal? No, it's an optic nerve coloboma. That's a morning glory type optic nerve coloboma. It doesn't have a lot of pigment on it, but it is resulted in you know non-recoverable very poor vision in this eye um, you can try to make it better try patching them it probably won't work and at some point when they start getting picked on at school you want to straighten that eye out and make it look straight what's the other really important intervention for this patient safety glasses okay and uh, uh, you want to put them in safety glasses because the idea is protecting that other eye from injury is important now this patient is a unilateral AFIG. Uh, this is the most asymmetric Bruckner test you're ever going to see. She has sensory esotropia associated with amblyopia associated with her monocular aphakia. We'll straighten that eye out, but it is not going to make her binocular. This, again, is what part of this is the optic nerve, right? This is where you should see the nerve, and it turns out that this is really the nerve right here. And not all of that is nerve. What is this? Optic nerve hypoplasia. Congenital cataract can cause, this is a really pretty one. And I, um, now this child, this is another reason that we see kids urgently with new onset strabismus that's been noticed. And when you look here, you notice blood vessels here, right? And this mass, and that's retinoblastoma. It's a large retinoblastoma. And, uh, and so, again, something to be aware of. And this patient, and what we're looking at here is primary and secondary deviation. It turns out that she has a right third nerve palsy. And um, there's some imbalance between up and down, which is why the eye's going up, not down, which is what you might typically expect. When she fixes with her normal left eye, she's got a fairly large exotropia, but look what happens when she fixes with a paretic right eye. The left eye's right out of the picture. So this is the primary deviation, this is the secondary deviation. Secondary deviation is when you fix with a paretic eye. You'll probably see something about that. Infantile ET again. This is my daughter. Um, she's now a nurse over at primary. This was taken a few years ago. And uh, this is with her glasses. She has accommodative ET. And uh, her eyes are straight. She's got normal vision and binocularity. It does work. Um, and again, infantile estropia, just to show you that not everybody with wide intercanthal distance and epicanthal folds has pseudoesotropia. People can have lice and fleas. And uh, <laughs> this ch child clearly, you know, has issues. Now, what are we looking at here? What do you see in this picture? After we take the cover away, what's going on with that right eye? What's up? Okay. This is dissociated vertical deviation. And it's at least part of the time manifest, it is right now. And so, likely that this child, the next question is how old were you when you had your first eye muscle operation? Did you have misaligned eyes as a child? You'll occasionally see this where there isn't any history of that, but that's rare. Now this patient, again, what we're looking at here is under the cover, right now the left eye is covered, it's looking at the ceiling, the right eye is covered, it's looking at the ceiling, when he looks right at you, his eyes are straight. This is latent DVD. And this child, again, just looking at this picture, when you look here, you should wonder, does that child have a fourth nerve palsy? And remember, the way that with fourth nerve palsies, right, left, right, left, right, left, meaning with right fourth nerve palsy, you've got a right hypertropia that is worse in left gaze and on right head tilt. And, and so this child has a left 
head tilt as he looks at you because he's trying to fix his right hyper that he has when he tips his head to the right. So which eye has the phoretic fourth nerve? Right, right. right. Okay, very good. And then this guy tips his head to the right, drops his chin down a bit. Which is his paretic fourth nerve? Left. Left. And what this shows is the X cyclo rotation of the fundus that you will often see, particularly in patients who have congenital fourth nerve palsies. Magnified view of that. This, you should be able to draw a line from center of optic nerve. That fovea should be here, and it has shifted this far. In patients who are aphasic, I've actually used that to do a, a Harada Ito procedure. We try to affect just torsion and adjusted that in the operating room looking with the indirect ophthalmoscope to try to level things out to get rid of torsional diplopia. And a guy who could tell me that things were tilted, but he couldn't express how much they were, you know, with baggling lenses to measure things. So I just looked at him in the operating room and he was actually quite happy afterwards. So you can use this at times for patient's benefit. And now this patient, what is this? This patient is straight when he looks straight ahead. He looks up and right, he looks good. When he looks up and left, this right eye doesn't go up. Two things that could be causing this. One restrictive, one not. Lack of elevation and adduction. Brown syndrome, that's the number one diagnosis. But until you know it's tight, what else should be lifting the eye in adduction? Which muscle? Okay, so if he had a right inferior oblique paresis, it could cause a similar picture. And until you know that's tight, you take a hold of the eye and move it, you can't separate the two. Worth remembering. And that might be something that would show up. Now this patient, this left eye doesn't go up when he looks up and right. It doesn't go up when he looks straight up. And it doesn't go up much at all when he, you know, it still goes up a little bit, but not much when he looks up and left. So what is this condition in contrast to Brown's? Double elevator palsy, also known as monocular elevation deficiency with current terminology. Now, this patient, this kid, when he looks straight ahead, he's got small angle left esotropia with a little bit of a face turn, he actually fuses. When this left eye is adducted, notice the height of the palpebral fissure, and when he tries to look to his left, look at how wide that fissure is open. What's he got? Which eye? Which eye is the abnormal eye? Which one has the narrowing and the widening fissure? The left. The left. That's the one that's got the joints. It's got co-contraction. What's going on there is that when he tries to look to his right, both his medial and lateral contract. That's the co-contraction. Pulls the eye posteriorly. Palpebral fissures look like they narrow. When he tries to go to his left, the medial relaxes and lets the eye come forward. The lateral doesn't pull. That's, it just passively pushes the lids open as the eye comes forward. And notice, this is, you'll see parents, at least, you know, six or seven out of 10 kids with Duane's type one in the left eye will show up with a parent telling you that the right eye is crossing. That is almost always the case and this is why. I had a, a, a kid I saw who was in his late teens when I was a fellow who was an only child Mom and dad sat in the same place at the dinner table all a child's life. And mom kept saying, his eyes crossed. Dad kept saying, no, it's not. Dad was a physician, so he won the argument, supposedly. And then they had him looked at when he was about 18. And I said, well, you're both kind of right. It turns out that mom looked from this perspective. She sat on the kid's right. Dad looked, I mean, rather, dad looked over here. Mom sat over here. Every time the kid looked at mom, things looked really funky. <laughs> and, and so, you know, did they ever think of switching places at the dinner table? No. So, not, not the best. And then there's this patient here. And what we're looking at here again is that this patient has small angle esotropia when he is fixing with this right eye. When he fixes with the left eye, he has large angle esotropia, and this is acquired, it's not Duane syndrome. What has he got? If you looked at his ductions inversions, and you'd have to add, you know, say, I want to see his ductions inversions, this left eye does not abduct. 
And this started suddenly um, after a head bump. He's got six nerve palsy. This is a six nerve palsy. And then Dwayne's, basically, again, Dwayne's, this right eye is not going out. It is not, it, in primary position, things look pretty good. And we look to the left, it doesn't go in. So in type three Dwayne's, there's no abduction, adduction. <coughs> I didn't have another picture. I apologize for taking one out of the book, but I wanted to show one. And what does this wide-eyed stare tell you? Thyroid. Thyroid disease, absolutely. As does this. Now this kid, there's a whole series of people in his family, all of whom lift their head like this. They look down the end of their nose. They have ptosis. Their eyes don't go up. What do they got? CPOE. Yes, not CPOE. But they've got fibrosis syndrome. They got congenital fibrosis of the extraocular muscles. CPOE. What you're going to see there, kind of a variant of what you see with Turner Sayer kids, where you wind up with a mitochondrial myopathy. Whereas these kids, it is an abnormality in genesis of the muscles, including the levator. So they, they all kind of look like the folks from Deliverance, you know, on the porch, and they line up for a family photo. And you get a family picture, and they've all got their chin up, and they've got various, I've had some sort of surgery to fix things. You can't make this kid normal. What you can do is you can try to give him, with eye muscle surgery and lid surgery, a more normal appearance so he isn't tortured at school, and I think it's our obligation to do that. I'm not making fun of him. But it is funny when you look at the family photo, and, and, and Grandma will be there and she'll say, well, what's wrong? He looks just like Uncle Henry. <laughs> I don't want to fix this. <laughs> and this patient, who intermittently has this really droopy-eyed appearance, and then sometimes has a bright, bushy-eyed appearance, and sometimes comes in and the eyes are turned in and sometimes they're turned out. What have we got? Myasthenia. Myasthenia, absolutely. The same with this guy. I saw a patient again when I was a fellow, and Debbie Alcorn, who's now my counterpart at Stanford that Dr. Tame will get to work with. Um, Debbie called me and she said, boy, you must have had a bad day. You looked at this kid and said the kid had left-sided ptosis and 50 diopters of XT. I'm seeing him today. The kid has right-sided ptosis and he's 50 diopters ET. And it turned out, yes, he had myasthenia. <laughs> we were both right. And now this, uh, this child here, we've got this very, this kid doesn't smile. He's got a furrowed tongue. And notice the eyes, he's got small angle esotropia. Um, and his eyes do not move from side to side at all. What's he got? Yeah, maybe a sequence. And in this, this is a bilateral, lateral gaze paresis. It is not bilateral, just six nerve palsies. If it was bilateral six nerve palsy, the kid could abduct normally, and, and their eyes just don't move normally at all horizontally. And you can try to make them straight by doing eye muscle surgery, but they will, you cannot make them binocular. Um, it's a kind of a sad disorder. Um, and now, what's going on with this patient? Patient here is, this is basically right gaze, primary position and left gaze. Patient had optic neuritis 10 years ago. They've got a funny looking MRI scan. It's an INO. And where, what part of the brain stem is the lesion in that caused this? MLF, that's right, on the right. So that is something that is worth, now A and V patterns again, just this would be what kind of pattern? A and Good. And these are similar. This is basically an A pattern where if you see this, we've got this sort of configuration, which is where that description came from. And this patient, in contrast, has this sort of configuration, V pattern. And this is a patient who has a large angle ET and down gaze, XO and up gaze, over elevation and adduction. And so if we were to fix this, we would operate to take care of any misalignment in primary position horizontally. And would you shift muscles or would you weaken the offending oblique? Work on the obliques. Okay, and those questions do show up. What they'll do though usually is they're not gonna call for subtle judgments. They're gonna put in things that are just plain wrong, like for esotropia doing medial rectus resection or a superior oblique tenotomy or something like that. 
so that, you know, just say, is this a reasonable thing to do for this patient? Not is it absolutely what I would do, but is it a reasonable thing to do? And that's probably the answer. And, and what they're looking for is just your ability to think through things. This is a totally detached retina and you see ciliary processes. This patient has stage five end of game ROP. And again, just to review, demarcation line, ridge, extra retinal tissue, stage three, and the stages of retinal detachment, extra foveal, foveal involving, and then total detachment. And to back up, hang on here for just a second. Zone one, the circle whose radius goes from optic nerve twice the distance from there to the fovea. If vessels are just inside here, this is zone one. The area outside that where the radius of the circle goes from optic nerve to nasal or a serrata, that's zone two and what's left is zone three. That you need to remember, there often is some sort of question about that. These are arbitrary things that when this was arrived at in a hotel room in Calgary, Alberta, um, people thought that most people could look at and fairly reliably say where these things are. There isn't a landmark in the eye, but you can see the optic nerve, you can see the fovea, and you can see the nasal aura serrata, which is why when you do exams with me, I pick on everybody so much about finding the nasal aura serrata, because until you can find the nasal aura, you can't really play the ROP game and figure out what's going on with an individual patient. And I'm gonna stop there for a second because I do wanna go through one patient example just to hit something because there often also is a three-step test question on here that isn't a fourth neural palsy and how do we go through thinking about that. So I'm gonna hit this, close this, and I'm gonna go back here and go to this. And then I want to come down to, so when the cause is not superior oblique palsy, where are we? And this patient, if you go through what we said about right, left, right, left, right, left, left hypertropia, but this left hypertropia is clearly worse than left gaze, not right gaze and it is worse on left head tilt. So how do we sort through this? What I do, and what I'd recommend you do if you've got some scratch paper there, is you draw yourself a little picture of these, and this is looking at right eye, left eye, with the superior rectus, inferior oblique as the elevators, inferior rectus, superior oblique as the depressors. And so the first question is going to be with this left hypertropia, which muscles, if they were paretic, could cause this left eye to be up? Knock out the bottom ones there. The there, and what about could the upper ones on the right cause the right eye to be down and the left eye to be up? So let's look at that. And so, gosh, that's what we did. And so let's mark that. Okay, so that's one, the first thing that we do. And then the question is going to be is it worse off to the left and right, where what we're going to do is circle some groups of muscles. One side, it'll either be these two or these two. And this was worse off to the left side, wasn't it? So you want to circle those off to the left? Let's do that. We'll put a line there. And so now we've narrowed things down to four, to basically two possible contenders, haven't we? And so the issue here then, is it a right inferior oblique paresis or a left inferior rectus paresis? Then the issue of this head tilt thing, and it's worse on head tilt left, isn't it? Now. You can just say, well, I've got the head tip left. I'm gonna take things to the left here. I'm gonna draw lines here. The thing that also makes sense to me with this, when you think about is it worse on left head tilt or right head tilt to say which muscles are doing it, and what I do is I tip my head and say if it's worse on left head tilt, is it the incyclotorters or excyclotorters I'm worried about? And on my left eye, when I tip my head to the left, I have to in cycle rotate to keep things level, don't I? Right eye has to X cycle rotate. So we know which muscles on my, if I now with left head tilt here, it's worse on left head tilt. I've got my in cycle torters and I've got my, so on the left eye, my in cycle torters are which muscles? Superior rectus, 
super oblique, so it still works. We're tipping to the left here. And then on my right eye, when I tip to the left, I've got an X cycle rotate. And you know that both inferior oblique and inferior rectus are the paired X cycle rotators, correct? So we're going to make this sort of. Come on, machine. Don't let me down now. There we go. And so, and then you look for something that you've basically got marked that's in blue that has two arrows there. And the candidate here is a inferior oblique paresis. And this actually doesn't happen that infrequently. I operate, you know, probably once every couple of months on somebody with an inferior oblique paresis. The best course of action is to recess the contralateral superior rectus because it turns out that they're worse in left gaze. If you recess that superior rectus, that's going to have most of its vertical effect in left gaze and gaze left and up where their eye doesn't go, so you're balancing out their deviation. Um, so again, does that make sense how to work through that? Think through that, and I think that's where I'm going to leave you uh, with this. I guess there was one other thing. Let me just look at this stuff right here because I think I have a, let's just, go through these for just a second. I want to look, there is a patient who's got, I think I put in here, <laughs> not that patient. This is, no, not the sixth nerve, okay. So this patient here, this is a head tilt, so we're in a fourth nerve palsy territory. And this is a patient with a patient who's got a right hyper worse than left gaze and probably has uh, increases on right head tilt. There's no question he's got a fourth nerve palsy, right? The question then, we got this patient, and this is basically a patient who's got this exam, and this does show up. And this is one of the things just to think about. And this is a patient, when you first look at this, you say, well, gee, the patient's got a right hyper. It's worse over here in left gaze. It's worse on right head tilt, um, although I didn't say that here. Um, uh, but there are a couple of things that should raise a red flag here, actually three that I can see. One is that we've got esotropy and down gaze. Two is this flick left hyper in gaze down and right, which doesn't make sense with a right fourth nerve palsy. And then there's this issue, 20 degrees of X cyclo. So what's going on here? It's bilateral. And when they show you fourth nerve palsy, I want you to remember to look, ask yourself, could this be bilateral? If you see a V pattern, if you see more than about 12, 13 degrees of X cyclotorsion, or if you see, and they'll show, you know, large amounts of this, and then this flick or, or maybe one left hyper and gaze down and right. And just to try to trick you, bilateral fourth nerve palsy. Now, is this of practical significance? You bet it is, because in this patient, if you don't acknowledge it and either let the parents know that you might have to come back and do something if it's a child or let the, the patient know if it's an adult or deal with bilateral surgery. I mean, to give you an example, I saw a little girl in Surabaya when I was in Indonesia. They wanted me to operate on her. She had a very large left head tilt with her right superior oblique palsy. But she also had very dramatic overaction of her left inferior oblique. And she had esotropian down gaze. And she had lots of fundus torsion. It turns out she had a bilateral fourth. Now, it turns out that when you operate in fourth nerve palsies, if you want to get rid of the head tilt, you'll probably have more luck if you do something with the superior oblique. So I tucked her right superior oblique. But I also recessed her left inferior oblique because otherwise what would come up right after surgery is the parents would see this left eye up here. That's going to be accentuated by the browns that I'm going to induce when I tighten the right superior oblique. So I did that, try to get a better outcome and save my colleagues in Surabaya from having to try to sort out. Because otherwise, if you don't tell them ahead of time, people think you caused the problem with the other eye. Not that they had a bilateral palsy. You know, if you tell them how things might not turn out just the way they want, they think you're a smart doctor. If they wait and they tell you, or grandma tells you that you screwed up, they don't think you're very smart. Anyway, good luck with this test. If there are questions that come up as you're going through this and something isn't making sense, it's okay to call me. 
and uh, I uh, let me get out of this and otherwise what questions do you have about any of this any pediatric ophthalmology strabismus related topics uh, uh, that you've been coming across in your study any you guys just are you all in the midst of trying to review things and go through stuff it's you know I think it's I think purposefully causing you to review this stuff is in fact a good thing you know I don't look at it as is evil I think when I was in your shoes I thought it was evil I would recommend that you study I tried not studying my second year of residency I just said eh, I'm gonna take it and see what I know what I found out was that if you're being tested against people who are studying their hardest and reviewing things, you're not going to look very good. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, it, it wasn't a, a happy experience discussing that with my department chairman because I was already on his bad list. Thanks. That's it. Have a great weekend. Um.